Well, good morning. And it's so great to see so many of you here this morning. And I'd like to say thank you to our worship group this morning and to our special um, Simple Voices Choir that gave that, that uh, rendition. And uh, did you notice? Did you spot the Kiwi in that group, any of you? Not one, no. We're well represented from every nation just about here in the Wangarei Church. In that group alone, we had uh, representatives from the Philippines, from Burundi, from Zimbabwe, and also from Fiji. So praise the Lord. The gospel has gone to the whole world. Amen. I'd just like to give you a small update. On uh, three, three weeks ago, you would have noticed that a quarter of your church was not here because they were all becoming, learning how to become contagious Christians. So the contagious, contagious Christian program has uh, just about completed its first phase. And uh, after next week, we'll be contacting those people from the Contagious Christian Group and we'll be moving out into small groups. So look forward to be contacted uh, because hopefully after, after that meeting, you're still contagious, right? Um, and then, so from that nucleus, we're going to keep, keep building on our, our small groups. One, to build on our friendship evangelism and discipling, and it was amazing, just out of that small group, how one of our members said, isn't it amazing, I did not realise how easy it is to disciple. And that's a wonderful, wonderful statement. Also, a very, very, very big thank you from our sister in Germany, Carmen, for all those kind comments that you sent her. We popped in a few DVDs so that she knows that we still have uh, Pastor Adrian and myself here and, and uh, some other people. And she said, I'm going to have to go into hospital more often if I'm going to get uh, greetings like this. So thank you. Thank you again. I'd just like to also mention a, a special little testimony that um, I experienced um, two, weekends, two weeks ago. And I don't want to take away anything from Pastor Adrian's sermon last week where we talk about personal glorification because that's what we don't do. We give all the glory to the Lord, don't we? Amen. And it's about walking in the joy of the Lord. Last Wednesday, we, a week ago, I came to, uh, to hold the, the prayer meeting and um, no one turned up. So I had uh, a prayer by myself and spoke to the Lord, did one or two things, but I noticed I could hear rain falling where it shouldn't be, water falling where it shouldn't be. So I went out here into the park, parking area and I was looking back on the roof, couldn't see anything different. But then a lady comes out of the refuge centre here and says, hi, Gary, how are you doing? I said, I'm good, thanks. And we started to share one or two things um, that actually asked us, our, our board, if they could use rooms here in our church. And I said, well, if you like, um, you can come and have a look at the rooms and see if they're adequate for what you need. She said, that'd be great. So she came in and then we continued our conversation out here in the parking lot. And she shared with me that there is just so much sadness happening happening in family lives uh, all over the place. Every day they're encountered with it from um, wives being beaten, children being beaten and all sorts of things. And then she shared also how her husband had just had a, a triple bypass. And I went, wow, that's pretty, pretty, pretty sad. And, and she's working hard over here. So we shared one or two things. And of course, I explained to her, you know, this is another sign that we have in prophecy of what's going to take place before the Lord comes. So I said that before we departed, I said, Val, how about we have a prayer together? She said, can we? And I said, yeah. So right there in the car park, we had a prayer together. And I prayed especially for her husband uh, who had this triple bypass. After the prayer, she said, thanks very much. She said, I'm going to be floating around the supermarket as I go shopping now because she experienced the joy of the Lord. And that's what discipling is about, is bringing people to the, to the knowledge of the joy of the Lord. Amen? Right. Today we're celebrating a very special service, as, uh, as David mentioned. We're celebrating a, a communion service. And of course, if we're not walking in the joy of the Lord, then what is wrong? Why aren't we walking in the joy of the Lord? And only you can answer that. I can't. But what a great opportunity there to look at that today uh, on the Communion Sabbath. I'd like you to turn in your, in your Bibles today to the book of John chapter 2.
the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And uh, I'd just like to start uh, reading from verse, verse 12 down to 17. So John, chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. Simply says, After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and pulled out the changes money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The seal of thine house have eaten me up. Wow, what a sad occasion that Jesus had to experience there um, in the cleansing of the temple. Powerful verse is verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money, change, the changes money and overthrew the tables. You know, this is such a power, powerful verse and it's tucked in between his first miracle with the changing of water and wine in Cana and the next big discourse that he has with Nicodemus about being born again. But when you look up, just read that, how it says when he left Canaan, he went down to Capernaum, and then he went up to Jerusalem. And I, as I read that, I thought, wow, he went up to Jerusalem. And when you look at that in reality, or geography, from the ge geographical point of view, that is a long way. Capernaum is up in the north of Jerusalem, right, by the Sea of Galilee, and it says he went up to Jerusalem. So when I looked this up on, up on the computer to see what distance it was, I came up with 183 k kilometers, right? That's a long way, isn't it, to walk? And it's actually a bit more because when I read that, um, when, I, when I worked it out on the computer, it didn't recognize the city of Capernaum, but there's a new city called Tel Hum, so I had to take another city that it would recognize in the distance, so it's actually around about 200 kilometers that Jesus, um, that Jesus walked. The Spirit of Prophecy mentions that he, Jesus, as he journeyed, he joined himself to a large company of people traveling to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. He noticed that their conversation was continually about the coming of the Messiah, as many had heard John preaching about and calling all to repentance at the Jordan. Amazing. They're talking about the Messiah and here he is in their very midst. Even then, he tried to explain from prophecy as they moved along the message of John and aroused the people to a closer study of God's word, but of course, to no avail. The Jewish leaders had instructed the people that at Jerusalem they were to be taught to worship God. Passover week was a big event and it saw large numbers assembling in Jerusalem coming from all parts of Palestine and the world and even from these distant lands. And naturally, because of the distance travelled, it was not convenient to bring the animals for sacrifice with them. So, for the convenience of these people, animals were bought and sold in the outer court of the temple. Here, all classes of people assembled to purchase their offerings here, all foreign currency, all foreign money was exchanged for the coin of the sanctuary. The coin of the sanctuary, sanctuary was the temple shekel, shekel. Every Jew would, was required to pay yearly a half shekel as a ransom for his soul, and the money thus collected was used for the support of the temple. Besides this, large sums were also bought as free will offerings to be deposited in the temple treasury and it was required that all foreign coin should be changed for a coin called, again, the temple shekel, which was accepted for the service of the sanctuary. 
The money changing gave opportunity for fraud and extortion. And it had grown into a disgraceful traffic, which was a source of revenue to the priest. The dealers demanded exorbitant uh, prices for the animals sold, and they shared their profits with the priest and rulers, and thus enriched themselves at the expense of the people. I want you to visualize this, actually. Picture it in your mind. What was actually happening here at the temple? The temple of God, the sanctuary that Jesus had uh, initiated. It was as if you would be at the sale yards. Many of you know the sale yards in, here in Kauri. It would be similar to that, whereby the, the, uh, the stock is auctioned with auctioneers shouting out the prices of, of the animals. And it's not a quiet place. You've got animals mooing, being chased about, and you've got all these auctioneers uh, presenting. So it would be a similar din here in the temple. Because of the number, number of people present from all these lands and the amount of animals required, it was a noisy coming and going of people and dealers bartering prices and worshippers securing their sacrifice. No longer was it a sacred temple, but a noisy animal market along with the juggling of money and prices being disputed. So great was the confusion that the worshippers were disturbed and the words addressed to the Most High were drowned in the uproar that invaded the holy temple. The Jews were exceedingly proud of their piety. They rejoiced over their temple and regarded a word spoken in this disfavor as blasphemy. How ironic is that? They were very rigorous in their performance of ceremonies connected with it, but the love of money had overruled their scruples. They were scarcely aware how far they had wandered from the original purpose of the service instituted by God himself. The sanctuary service that represented Christ himself and that pointed to Jesus was nearly lost. And remember, when the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai, the place was consecrated by his presence. Moses was commanded to put bounds around the mount and to sanctify it. And the word of the Lord was heard in warning. Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be pure, surely put to death. There shall not a hand touch it. And ye shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. Exodus 19, 12 and 13. This was taught the lesson that wherever God manifests his presence, the place is holy. The precincts of God's temple should have been regarded as sacred. But in the strife for gain, all this was lost. All this was lost sight of. There came to those, to the feet, to this feast, the Passover, those who were suffering, those who were want and distress. The blind, the lame, the deaf were there. Some were bored on beds. Many came who were too poor to purchase the humblest offering for the Lord. Too poor even to buy food, which to satisfy their own hunger. These were greatly distressed by the statements of the priests. The priests boasted of their piety. They claimed to be the guardians of the people, but they were without sympathy or compassion. How sad is that? The poor, the sick, the dying made their vain plea for favor. Their suffering awakened no pity in the hearts of the priest. But then... As Jesus came to the temple, he took in the whole scene. He saw the unfair transactions. He saw the distress of the poor who thought that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness for their sins. He saw the outer court of his temple converted into a place of unholy trafficking. The sacred enclosure had become one vast exchange. Christ saw that something must be done. Numerous ceremonies were enjoyed upon the people without the proper instruction as to, as to their meaning, as to their The worshippers offered their sacrifice without understanding that they were typical of the only perfect sacrifice Jesus the Passover made. And among them, unrecognized and unhonored, stood the one symbolized by all these services. He had given directions in regards to the offerings. He understood their symbolic value and he saw that they were not perverted 
were not to be uh, perverted or misunderstood. Spiritual worship was fast disappearing. No link but bound the priest and rulers to their God. A very important lesson for us also as leaders and worshippers in God's church. Christ's work was to establish an altogether different worship. With searching glance, Christ takes in the scene before him and he stands upon the steps of the temple court. With prophetic eye, he looks into the future and sees not only years but centuries and ages. He sees how priests and rulers will turn the needy from their right and forbid that the gospel shall be preached to the poor. He sees how the love of God will be concealed from sinners and men will make merchandise of his saving grace. The confusion is hushed. The sound of traffic and bargaining has ceased. The silence becomes painful. A sense of awe overpowers the assembly. It's as if they were arraigned before the tribunal of God to answer for their deeds. Looking upon Christ, they behold divinity flashing through the garb of humanity. The majesty of heaven stands as the judge will. He speaks and his clear ringing voice, the same that upon Mount Sinai proclaimed the law that priests and rulers are transgression, is heard echoing through the arches of the sacred temple. Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Slowly descending the steps and raising the scourge of cords gathered up on entering the enclosure, an amazing in, uh, in our scripture reading in uh, 12.15, it says that Jesus had to make this, this scourge of cords because it's not his nature to, to carry one of these things around with him. He bids the bargaining company to depart from the precincts of the holy temple with a zeal and severity he has never before manifested. He overthrows the tables of the money changers, the coins fall ringing sharply, upon the beautiful marble pavement. None presume to question his authority, none dare to stop to gather up their ill gain or ill-gotten gain. Jesus does not smite them with the whip of cords, but in his hand and simple scourge seems terrible as if he was holding a flaming sword. Officers of the temple, speculating priests, brokers and cattle traders with their sheep and oxen rush from the place with the one thought of escaping the condemnation of his presence. Even the disciples were amazed. They'd never seen Jesus react in such a manner. They remembered, though that it was written, the zeal of thine house have eaten me up. Soon the tumultuous throng and their merchandise are far removed from the temple of the Lord. The courts are free from unholy traffic and a deep silence and solemnity settles upon the scenes of confusion. The presence of the Lord and of that Old sanctified, the mount has now made sacred, the temple read in his honor. You know, in the cleansing of the temple, Jesus announced that he was the Messiah and that he was about to enter upon his work in uh, saving the lost. That temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world, for eternal ages. It was God's purpose that every created being, from the bright and holy seraphim, angel to man, should be a temple for the indwelling of the Creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the Divine One. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride. They did not yield themselves as holy temples of the divine spirit of God. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem, filled with the tumult of unholy traffic, represented all too truly the temple of our heart, defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. 
rings true, doesn't it? In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lust, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. Brothers and sisters, have you ever cleansed your temple? And I do not have to tell you what sin or, temp or what part of your temple needs to be cleansed. You know it. And when I say that we are to cleanse the temple, I'm not just talking about um, having a garage sale and moving those sins on to someone else or cleaning out the shed. No, clean out your temple where the Holy Spirit is supposed to dwell. If you believe that Jesus is coming soon, it is time to clear the junk out of your temple. And when I say junk, there's a lot of junk that uh, is thrown at us each week anew. And of course, there's, there's the sins that we know that, uh, that uh, unfortunately evade our, our presence during the week. But there's, you know, there's, there's also modern sins that... Um, that people think, oh, it's okay, it's okay, but it's not okay. And I just think of addiction, not necessarily um, uh, substance addiction, but the addiction that we have to, in societies to social networking, to computer gambling, and, uh, and all these things, you know. Um, so much is thrown at our young people in regards to um, the sexual scene, but it's adultery for young and for old. We can't name it again or rename it. And you know, there's even theft that takes place. Theft in bringing our money to God, but also theft in the homes whereby partners run up huge accounts and uh, are expected for the other one to pay. Brothers and sisters, sin is sin and we have to clear it out of our temple. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in our, in our lives. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. That's powerful, isn't it? For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. We heard that when God came on the mountain, that the mountain was holy. Today we're in the holy presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We prayed that he will be with us. We asked that his spirit would be with us. So today we're in the holy presence of the Lord our God. We're in the holy presence as we celebrate not only another time of Passover in that the Lamb of God was sacrificed, but that he died for our sins, for these sins that we're cleansing out of our temple. And you know, we cannot do it by ourselves as we read. Jesus is the only one that can cleanse our temple. And if we're not in that relationship with him, you've heard me say it before, we're not in that close relationship with him, he cannot cleanse our temple. The devil will throw all these different things at us and will say, thank you, thank you very much. But when we're in that relationship with Jesus Christ, he will remove it from us. Only Jesus can cleanse our temple. But he will not force an entrance as we know in the book of Revelation 3.20. He comes not into the heart as to the temple of old, but he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Remember that door has no handle on the outside. He will not force his entry, but he's waiting for us to open the door so that he can come and sup as he wants to sup with us today. He will come not one day, or not for only one day merely, but for as long as we allow him to sup with us. His presence will cleanse and sanctify the soul so that it may be a holy temple unto the Lord and a habitation of God through the Spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, we advertise the fact that we are going to celebrate a communion service in three to four weeks' time. That's not just to use up the print or the ink in the printer. No, that's help you to prepare for this day. We only celebrate it four times a year, and yet a lot of us have forgotten the significance of the communion service. Let's just turn in our in our Bibles to the book of, of uh, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll be just reading from verse um, 27 here. I'm going to touch on this verse again, but I just want to uh, reiterate what I said here. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body that was offered on Calvary, but also his body, the church. And I realize that some of you may not have had time uh, not knowing, being visitors, that we're celebrating the communion service today. I realize too that some of you may not have had a chance to clean out the temple this week, but I'd like to encourage you to come forward as we have a prayer, a special prayer for that this morning. For those of you um, who want to come forward and, and just join with me, uh, please do. We'll just take a time out for a little prayer, and it doesn't matter uh, who comes. We don't want to know uh, that uh, what your sins are. We know that we are all sinners and come short of the glory of God. So I'll just take a few minutes to come down with me and just share a prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we come before you on our knees with thankful hearts that we can be in your presence this morning. Father, we thank you that you give us the strength that we need to overcome on a daily basis our wrongdoings, Lord. We thank you for your spirit, Lord. May your spirit come on upon us now and anoint us. And may Jesus help us to clean out our temples, Lord, to rid ourselves of those sins that separate us from you. Today, Lord, is a, is a high Sabbath, a holy Sabbath, Lord, and we thank you that you are with us today. Lord, please count every head worthy as we part to participate in this wonderful ceremony that was, um, had taken place so long ago. 2,000 odd years ago, Lord, you paid this price for us, and we know, Lord, that you're coming again soon. We pray that every head bowed here today will be worthy when you come to take us home. But, Father, for some of us, there will be a, a bigger journey a lot of difficulties, but Lord, help us not to store anything in our temple that will separate us from you. Father, we ask, us, ask you now to prepare us for the communion service. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>